The Julius Data Frames package is an alternative to Python's Pandas package, but can be used with Pandas using the pandas.jl wrapper package. First of all, we have to open the Julia repo, and after that, hit the right square bracket to go into the package mode, then type add data frames. Then all you have to do is to wait for the Julia to add the data frames package to your Julia environment. Depending on your computer, adding the package may take some time, so pour some coffee and wait for it. After the data frames package has been successfully installed, it's time to add the CSV package, so I type add CSV and wait for the package to be installed. After the CSV package is installed successfully, I clean up the output of the REPL by hitting Ctrl L at the same time, then type using data frames to check whether the package loads successfully, and also type using CSV to check whether the CSV package is installed successfully. Now it's time to use the actual data frames package. There are a few different ways to create new data frames. For this introduction, the quickest way to load the ANSCOM dataset and assign it to a variable ANSCOM is to copy paste several rows of data, convert them to an array and then rename the column names like this. ANSCOM's quartet comprises four datasets that have nearly identical simple descriptive statistics, yet have very different distributions and appear very different when graphed. Each dataset consists of 11 XY points as a tuple. You can create simple data frames by providing the information about rows and column names in an array. To create a completely empty data frame, you can supply the column names, Julia symbols, and define their types, remembering that the columns are arrays. For example, I use the vcat function to add data to my empty data frame that I have already defined as df. You can get the type of the ANSCOM variable by using the type of function which returns data frame as the type. To obtain a list of column names, use the names function. Other useful function is the size which returns the number of rows and number of columns. The describe function provides a quick overview of each column. Notice that some of the columns, all the x columns, contain integer values and others, all the y columns, are floating point numbers. Every element in a column of a data frame has the same data type but different columns can have different types. This makes the data frame ideal for storing tabular data. Strings in one column, numeric values in another, and so on. There are various ways to select columns. You can use the dot or period, the standard Julia field accessor, for example, anscom.y2 returns the column y2. Or you can use the general Julia convention for simple names. Precede the column names with a column, so column y2 refers to the column called y2, or column number 6. You can use integers and vectors of integers. Here's the sixth column, all rows of the ANSCOM's data frame. And here are columns 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. Here are the first X and Y columns. You can supply a regular expression to grab a set of matching column names. Here's the result showing all the columns whose names end in a 2. To access the third and fifth columns of the dataset ANSCOM, you can use any of the following. You can also access the columns using variables. For example, if a is equal to x3 and b is equal to y1, then we have to take rectangular slices. For example, we can use ANSCOMs 4 to 6 as the first argument and x2 to x4 as the second argument. By passing that range and that list, we get the selected rows and columns. Instead of range of rows, you can also specify individual rows using commas. And of course you can use the index numbers. To specify a range of rows and columns, use index numbers. Also notice that the row numbering for the return data frames is different. Rows 4, 5, and 6 became rows 1, 2, 3 in the new data frame. As with arrays, use the column on its own to specify all columns or rows when you want to view the contents. When you are modifying the contents, the syntax is different, as described later. So to see rows 4, 6, 8, and 11 showing all columns. And for all rows, columns x1 and y1 we have. You can select all the rows of a data frame where the elements satisfy one or more conditions. Here's how to select rows where the value of the element in column y1 is greater than 7. The inner phrase anscomy one greater than 7.0 carries out an element-wise comparison of the values in column y1 and returns an array of boolean true or false values, one for each row. Notice the broadcasting operator dot. These are then used to select rows from the data frame. It's as if you had entered anscom and passing a list of true or false values as the first argument and colon as the second argument.
So the code on line 81 and the code on line 83 are equivalent. That is, the comparison operator on line 81 will be converted to a list of true or false values. In a similar way, here is a result that contains every row where the value of the number in column Y1 is greater than that in column Y2. Another way to select matching rows is to use the Julia function filter. Combining two or more conditions is also possible. Here is a result consisting of rows where the value of y1 is greater than 5 and that of y2 is less than 7. An equivalent using filter function would be... Here I import a statistics package by running the using a statistics. You can apply a function to a column. To find out the mean of the values in the column named x2, we use mean and pass the anscom.x2 to it. The data frames package provides two convenient utilities, each call function and each row function. These can be used for iterating through every column or every row. Each value is a tuple of symbol, column heading, and data array. To apply the mean function to every column of the data frame, you can either use a comprehension, which returns a new array containing the mean values for each column. Alternatively, you can use a broadcasted version, that is mean dot and pass the each column and inside the each column pass the ANSCOM. Similarly, you can use the each row function to actually iterate through each row. For instance, in this data set, each element of each row is a number, so we could, if we want to, use each row function to find the meaningless mean of each row. Now let's shift our focus to statistics. The built-in describe function lets you quickly calculate the statistical properties of the columns of a data set. Supply the symbols for the properties you want to know, choosing from the mean, standard deviation, minimum, Q25, median, Q75, max, L-type, and unique, first, last, and n missing. We can also compare the XY datasets too. We can use the core function for the correlation. For instance, let's look at the correlation between XY datasets. Notice how similar these correlations are. X1, Y1 is the same as X2, Y2, X3, Y3, and X4, Y4. Each of the four datasets has the same mean, median, standard deviation, and correlation coefficient between X and Y. Judging by the simple summary statistics, you would think that they were pretty similar. Let's plot them. ANSCOM's quartet comprises four datasets that have nearly identical simple statistical properties, but are actually very different. Each dataset consists of 11 XY points. They were carefully constructed in 1973 by the statistician Francis Anscom to demonstrate both the importance of looking at your data and of graphing that data before relying on the summary statistics and the effect of outliers on statistical properties. The first appears to show a simple linear relationship corresponding to two variables correlated and following the assumption of normality. The second set of points is not distributed normally. There is an obvious relationship between the two variables, but it isn't linear and the Pearson correlation coefficient is not really relevant. In the third set, the distribution is linear but with a different regression line, which is offset by the one outlier which exerts enough influence to alter the regression line and lower the correlation coefficient from 1 to 0.816. Finally, the fourth set shows an example when an outlier is enough to produce a high correlation coefficient, even though the relationship between the two variables is not linear. The quartet is still often used to illustrate the importance of looking at a set of data graphically before starting to analyze according to a particular type of relationship and the inadequacy of basic statistic properties for describing realistic data sets. If you want to find a linear regression line for the datasets, you can turn to the GLM Generalized Linear Models package. Using GLM and Stats model, we add these packages to the Julia environment. To create a linear model, you must specify a formula using add formula macro, supplying the column names and the name of the data frame. The result is a regression model. Useful functions in the GLM package for working with linear models include summary function and coef function, which stands for coefficient. The coef function returns the two useful coefficients that define the regression line, the estimated intercept and the estimated slope. After getting these two values, it's easy to produce a function for the regression line in the form of y is equal to ax plus c. After defining the function f for describing the regression line, it can be drawn in a plot. Here we plot the first series and add a plot of the function fx with x running from 2 to 20. See how it compares with the smoothing line we used earlier.
not all datasets are as consistent and tidy as the examples that we have provided. It's possible that you'll read some data into a data frame only to discover that it's got a few problems with inconsistently formatted or missing elements. Here you'll create a simple test data frame by hand, defining the columns one by one. It's a short extract from what might be a periodic table. We can use the describe function to find information about our data frame. To add a column, we can use the hcat function, which adds another column of integers which will be called column x1 from 1 to n. This creates a copy of the data frame and we haven't changed p table or assigned the new data frame to a symbol. Instead, let's add melting and boiling points of our chosen elements to the table. I represent the data with mp and bp for melting points and boiling points. Notice the use of different syntax to access columns when changing them. If you just want to look at values, you can use left square bracket column comma your column name right a square bracket which provides you with a read only view of the data frame if you want to change the values use left a square bracket exclamation mark comma your column name right a square bracket the exclamation is the usual julian clue that indicates function that might modify the data arguments to illustrate how to create a new column based on things in the other columns we'll add a column called liquid showing for how many degrees of silicious an element remains liquid that is boiling points dash melting points to add or replace a column of a data frame with another column of data that is an array of the right length use axis function or the map function as shown on the line 192 and 194. You can also use rename exclamation mark function to rename columns. There is also a rename function without the exclamation mark which doesn't change the original data frame. The select exclamation mark function creates a new data frame that contains the selected columns. So to delete columns use select exclamation mark together with not which deselects a column that you don't want to include. It's easy to add rows, use push exclamation mark with suitable data of the right length and type. Those missing values should be replaced soon using the functions from earlier. We can locate the new element by name and change the value for liquid like this. Or we could use the atomic number to obtain access to the right row and do it that way. To delete rows, use the delete exclamation mark function with one or more row specifiers. Alternatively, you could delete rows by specifying a condition. For example, to keep rows where the boiling point is less than 100 Celsius, you could just find the rows that are greater than or equal to 100 Celsius. Then assign a variable to keep the result. To find values, the basic idea is to use an element while operator or function that examines all rows and returns an array of Boolean values to indicate where each cell meets to the criteria for each row. For instance, we can use ptable column melt less than 100 to get a 6 element bit array, then use this Boolean array to select the rows. You could use this to return rows where a value in a column matches a regular expression, and you can edit the elements in the same way. You can also find matching entries by using occurs in function with the dot operator. To investigate subsets and groupings, let's recreate the data frame ptable again and add another column. This column gives the state of each element at room temperature. It's now possible to collect up and group the elements according to their state. The group by function splits the original data frame into grouped data frames according to the values in the named column. For example, with three elements that are gases at room temperature and the others which are solid, we can obtain two grouped data frames. Here we are saving the grouped data frame in GD variable. The combine function lets you group the rows and then apply a function to one of the fields of every row in the group. We find the mean melting point of all the gases and the mean melting point of all the solid elements and we are using the group data frame again. The sort exclamation mark function works with data frames as well. You supply the columns on which to sort using the following syntax, sort, exclamation mark, and pass the p-table. The resulting data frame is sorted first by its state at room temperature, so gas before solid, then by its atomic weight, so iron before copper. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel to not lose future content on Julia programming. Also check out my Julia Programming for Beginners playlist. As always, see you all later.